welcome along this evening to this wonderful BAFTA Q&A. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to do a little bit of uh, housekeeping before I do my first introduction of the evening. Um, we will be opening it up to questions for you all watching this evening, so please don't be shy and please put your name in as well because it's always slightly well, it's a shame when we have anonymous people in there. It's like, you know, be loud and proud and tell us who you are. Um, also, just to let you know, there is an embargo on, um, on this evening's conversation until the 17th of September. Uh, and also don't forget that uh, from the uh, 20th of September from 9pm when the show airs on BBC, uh, all the episodes following the airing will be up on the iPlayer. Um, so without further ado, before I introduce the wonderful... Uh, screenwriter and cast you please may I introduce to you the uh, controller of BBC drama Piers Wenger. Hi everybody thank you for um, joining us for tonight's uh, q and I'm delighted to be introducing um, this event for BBC One's new Sunday night drama Us, David Nichols adaptation of his own hugely popular novel of the same name starring Tom Hollander, Saskia Reeves, Sophie Grabel, Tom Taylor, Ian de Cassica, Gina Bramhill and Thaddea Graham. Us tells the story of a husband, Douglas Peterson, who is blindsided when his wife Connie tells him that she's not sure that she wants to be married to him anymore. Agreeing to still go on their family holiday, a grand tour of Europe, Douglas vows to win back the love of his life and to repair his troubled relationship with his son Albie. Us brings the Peterson's poignant and often hilarious story to life and reflects the unique mix of humour and heartbreak of which David Nichols is a master. I would like to say a very special thank you to David for trusting us with his unforgettable novel and to producers Greg Bremen and Rowanna Ben from Drama Republic who have excelled themselves once again. To director Jeff Sachs for taking us on a whistle-stop tour of Europe, to Joe McClellan, commissioning editor at the BBC, and last, but by no means least, to Tom Hollander and Hannah Pescod, who we are honoured to be working with on their debut drama for BBC One as Bandstand Productions. Thank you to them and to the entire cast and crew. You're about to meet the top team, but before you do, this is a reminder that us starts this Sunday at nine o'clock on BBC One, and the whole series will drop that, will drop on iPlayer after that. Now I'm gonna hand back to Edith. Thank you so much, Piers. Uh, right, without further ado, um, and in no particular order, I'm just going to reveal them all in the order I have them written down. Please welcome Tom Hollander, Saskia Reeves, uh, Thalia Graham, Tom Taylor, and David Nichols. Hi, everybody. How are you all in this weird virtual world that we find ourselves in? <laughs> um, Thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, so much to talk to you guys about. And we will get across to questions from our, our audience um, tonight. David, if I can start with you, please, in terms yeah. of, you know, ad adapting your own work into, into a screenplay. And I guess, first of all, what, what made that decision for you? What was the kind of catalyst to, to you know, turning the book into a screenplay? Um, well, it's not something I necessarily think of when I write a book. You know, the book is written in the first person, in a very kind of narrow first person point of view, which is a hard thing to adapt. And it does other things which are very difficult to put on screen. Obviously, the travel, but, but also the skipping around in time. There's a 180 chapters and it's very fluid. In a novel, it's very easy just to put a little caption and say that it's 20 years earlier, 15 years earlier or whatever. Um, in a monologue like that, in that kind of novel form, you can, it's fine for Douglas to talk about his own relationship with his father or tell an anecdote or something. Whereas in the screenplay, there's always has to be this forward momentum. So it wasn't an obvious candidate. And at the same time, it was sort of influenced by film in, in lots of ways. I wanted it to have the kind of propulsive quality of a thriller for it to be about relationships, but for there to be a kind of forward momentum, a kind of chase, a pursuit. Um, mm. It's a kind of rogue movie, you know, it has maybe a kind of American indie movie quality to it, the idea of a, a close look at family relationships on a particular journey. The, the short chapters that make up the book, my previous book one day had 20 kind of big chunks. This uh, novel had 180 small little snapshots and I suppose there's something analogous maybe to a screenplay in this notion of, of a number of incidents that take place in quick succession. And um, uh, so 
it was always going to be a challenge. At the same time, I wanted it to have a kind of that sumptuous, sunny, bittersweet, rogue movie quality as well. So it wasn't uh, my intention when I wrote the book, but I loved the challenge of doing it. Mm. The tone of it is is particularly, I think, kind of brilliant and warm, and it kind of just, it, you kind of can look Judy in it, I think, as well, which is is just kind of, and the colour that I think it sort of throws up as well is 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 kind of wonderful. Um, Tom, Mr. Hollander, if you mind if I come to you, since we have two Toms, uh, Tom H. <laughs> um, congratulations on, on this, both in terms of you know your performance, but also as a producer. Um, and I just wanted to ask what the connection was you had with this story and what it was that, that made you wanted to grasp onto it both for both those kind of roles, really. Uh, well, because it was suggested and <laughs> uh, and it was so good. Um, uh, it's such a good part. Um, and Hannah and I had been looking for something that we could, uh, it wasn't completely finished. Um, David had written three episodes, not, not four by then. We were still, um, so we, we worked very closely with him, which was a huge privilege and enormously fun. And that was, one of the reasons that we wanted to be uh, in production was to work with writers on the scripts and, you know, the, in the gestation period. Mm -hmm. So, and we got to do that here, which was, uh, which was very, very rewarding and then continued into um, the post-production uh, after the shoot. Um, and as an actor, yeah, it's a, it's a, is he, Douglas is a very, very good part, um, a challenging part because he's mm -hmm. quite annoying and not, he's not, <laughs> you're not playing somebody who's heroic, who the audience is necessarily always going to uh, like or be on the same side as. Um, it's complex, it's a, um, and the other characters' points of view are uh, as important, um, uh, particularly Connie and, and Albie, um, mm -hmm. Saskia and, uh, Tom, Saskia is below me on this. I don't know if she is, everyone else. And Tom is, no, there. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> we had a wonderful adventure. I want to mm. say, I wish um, that there were two other people on this, um, on the screen now, but just uh, Jeff Sachs, our brilliant director, and Hannah Pescod, who um, our brilliant producer, because, when we made the show, that it was um, a very uh, it was a very full summer, um, <laughs> and it was a very tiring summer. But it was full of wonderful adventures and intensity and complication and difficulty, and it was exhausting and exhilarating. And we were rushing all around Europe, and Hannah and Jeff held it together. And mm -hmm. um, anyway, if they're watching out there, thank you, thank you. And uh, it's very exciting that. Um, it's going to be on the screens and people are going to see it finally. Um, yeah. So, uh, and anyone else in the crew who's out there, hello, thanks for the adventure. An adventure which seems impossible now um, mm -hmm. in the current climate, an adventure that would not be possible to shoot at the moment. So uh, it was a privilege and even more of a privilege now in retrospect. Um, Saskia, if I can, um ask you about Connie um, congratulations on this role because there's she's a fantastic character and there's so much truth I think in both in terms of how you play her but but in terms of you know what she addresses and what she brings up and what she you know lays on the table pretty much um, but I wanted to, because you know within the book obviously the point of view comes from from Douglas and so you're very, you're very much given her a voice yeah. she didn't really have as much in the in the book but but with the screenplay was that kind of fun to explore and and work out what kind of voice you were going to give her, really. Yeah, very much so. I mean, um, I think, uh, I mean, David wrote the screenplay, so he, so I, I it gives Connie the chance to um, become more three-dimensional. And um, in fact, I, there's, there's still things I think that uh, Connie, thinks or does or, or um, 
her private life. She has quite a strong private life, actually. I've decided. Um, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was great fun to to be able to flesh that out and uh, make her real. Um, and as Tom said, I mean, it's such a wonderful part, such a wonderful story. And mm. Were you given space to kind of play with these characters and particularly with that relationship with, with kind of Douglas and Connie? Because when you watch it, the conversations and the, the you know, kind of the, particularly the, the two ways between the two of you feel so natural and so conversational and, and kind of fluid that, I, I, you know, I wanted to ask whether there was much encouragement to to improvise or to play and, you know, and sort of react, I guess, to each other. Well, there wasn't any David writes like that. <laughs> uh, so it wasn't improvised. It's, he's uh, written it like that. Uh, I think we, we might have chucked in the odd thing, but not really, that, that his writing is very, very natural. In terms of our interplay, um, we had quite a lot of, natural that's the that's i suppose that's the bit the actors do isn't it we we and we saskia and i have known each other a long time we have quite a lot of friends in common we have a certain amount of history we knew each other in the 90s we knew each other at the same time um as the story uh so a lot of it we got for free in that sense but, <laughs> but um and We've then never we, been married though, have we, Tom? <laughs> we imagined it. Yes. So, so, uh, <laughs> well, I place. believed you. Yeah, we were married last summer, weren't we? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I bet it felt like it on this amazing kind of intense, you know, trip that you all went on. Um, Tom, Albie is this, he's not just the son of these, this mm. pair. He he kind of draws, I think, things out of them in, individually, you know, makes them both kind of question things about each other and, and themselves, really. Um, can you tell me a little bit about Albie and, and where you see him and what his relationship being with within the story? Yeah, so Albie has two almost completely different relationships with his parents. He's got his, his mum, who he relates massively because they're both artistic and they've, they've got a very strong... Um, very strong relationship whereas his dad is this kind of this scientist who is anything but artistic and he almost condescends Albie when he talks about his career and his lifestyle and it was it, he becomes the talking point for both of them because it kind of um you know you get a lot of you get parents and there's always oh who's the whose side is your son on and, and then it's like it's not about that it's about working together and kind of bringing bringing Albie up as um, a whole person who's in a Good relationship with both of them so it's really fun to be able to play the different points of view um and the different sides of the, the relationship in the family here yeah. and um, thadia i i thought it was really fascinating to hear i mean first of all tell us where cat fits into the story uh so cat meets alvi uh what uh she's a busker she's well a street musician actually is what she likes to call herself mm -hmm. so she's been kind of on her own little tour around europe and she bumps into Albie. And then that's how she joins the merry little band. And uh, <laughs> I think she, she's so loud and she's so confident um, and unaware of how other people are kind of, well, no, not unaware. I think she knows exactly what she's doing. Knows exactly how to push Douglas's bu buttons. Uh, and I think she really enjoys that. But also kind of is looking at this family and thinking, oh, that's really lovely. And I don't really have that. Oh, she doesn't really have that. Um, so I think it's almost a little bit of nostalgia, I suppose, looking into their dynamic. Well, I like the idea that I read that you gave her a backstory and that was kind of really important for you to kind of find her in a way. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, I started reading the book when I got the part and Kat's originally a Kiwi and she's playing this accordion and I started I actually stopped reading that and focused on our scripts and used our scripts as the Bible for me, for that character, because um, I didn't want to start mixing anything. And it was really important to me that that Kat felt real and very grounded, despite her being so massive and so loud and confident. And it's a, it's a role that I've never really played before. Um, so I wanted to make sure that she was 
as truthful as possible because those people do exist those there are cats in the world and i just needed to find my way into that mm. um i'll be um i just wanted to ask tom making sure that you've kept up the guitar skills since production finished I, I know yeah, you... I, I, it was funny because when we were in amsterdam uh, my brother came out and um thadia and my brother were both teaching me along with um, some other crew members it was all a big team effort to kind of get my skills <laughs> <laughs> Even when doing it on the streets, no one really paid much attention to me. <laughs> yeah, very, um, very convincing, I've got to say. Mm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping to see a guitar hung behind you just so that we knew you were keeping yeah. it up, but that's all right. <laughs> and obviously people watching as well, they, they you know, mentioned that this, you have this, this wonderful trip around, you know, these incredible European um, cities and you know, you watch that and you think, oh, best job in the world. You know, you get to go here, there and everywhere. But I guess the, you know, the reality of that is that it's much different because I imagine it was quite a tight schedule and there was quite a lot. Well, you tell me, was there a, you know, was, was it hard, hard work? It wasn't the kind of glamorous, you know, postcards kind of vacation away, you know, wor working vacation that we, we, we sort of watch it and think that that's what was going on. Well, a lot of the, um, you see a lot of the train, in the train scenes, there's about, um, it was about, it was an eight hour train journey we went from, uh, I can't remember, Pat, was it Paris? Paris? Barcelona. Yeah, to Barcelona. And throughout those eight hours, we were filming every second of it. So normally you'd expect our luxury travelling to Barcelona, but we were there <laughs> sweating on the train, the whole crew, we were all like... Yeah. Yeah. I remember doing costume changes in the tiny little toilet, you know, in <laughs> hangers and things try that <laughs> and i think we nearly missed that train who was with were you with me tom yeah. some confusion wasn't there yeah the there was some detour in paris and we had to get on the train to, to, to go and do the, the day's filming and it was so close it would have been a disaster and very expensive problem <laughs> david's got his head in his hands there in the corner I think I I think Tom and Hannah and and Pat, Pam and all sorts of amazing people they did the most extraordinary thing, getting us organised on set in all these different cities. It was truly impressive. Were, 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 it, nothing I nothing to do with me. Hannah Hannah and Pat Leeds they they made that yeah. work. That was um, for all those different countries. And every country had a different crew. So the British crew met a, a, a Dutch crew or a French crew or an Italian crew, um, Spanish crew, and uh, all of this inconceivable in a COVID world because um, you'd have to have two weeks each time for everyone to quarantine. And we'd meet and just keep going. There was no, there was no uh, slack in the system. Interestingly, that train journey from Paris to Barcelona, we were shooting the, the sequence in the story. We were going from Paris to uh amsterdam and um if you look very carefully out of the window in that sequence we're, we're actually going into sort of southern europe it's getting drier and drier and rockier and rockier it's not going to the flat lowlands of uh <laughs> of holland but not um, a tulip in sight no one will know <laughs> um is, is that uh, in terms of writing you know that 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 part of it, David, you know, in terms of, of representing what's in the book on screen with that side of things, that must have been a wonderful kind of luxury to, to explore in terms of bringing that to life for the screen. Yeah, yeah I mean, thrilling. I mean, the inspiration for the book came from a book tour I did when, I, when one day came out that I was seeing all these cities for the first time and, and loving them. And I, I hadn't been into railing, so I was sort of into railing in my in my 40s and having a wonderful time and wanting to put that feeling on the page, you know, where you're in a city, you want to see everything and you've only got an afternoon, the kind of frenetic quality of travel as well, the joy uh, and also the kind of the shabby hotel rooms and the bad restaurants and all of that stuff as well. But it was also, when you, when you put that in the script, it becomes a series of negotiations because it's hugely problematic and you can't, there's an episode in the book where he has a, uh, an hour to see Florence and he tries and it goes wrong. And it's a really lovely little set piece, but you can't just drop that in. You know, you have to, you have to make certain alliances. So we did have to cross out Munich and Madrid and uh, one or two museums, but 
the, originally the conceit was also that each episode would have there'd be a kind of um, museum of the week. That there'd be the Louvre episode and the Academia episode and the um, the Rice Museum episode and. Uh, there was a certain amount of movement with that. We did get wonderful, wonderful stuff in the museums and galleries, and those are some of my favorite scenes, but it's hugely problematic. And um, I'm sh massively grateful because I skived off. I was doing a book tour, so I didn't come on set. I, and, and, and I know how stressful it must have been, and I'm, I'm very grateful. I mean, the amount of footage we got in Venice in a very, very, very short period of time, and the way it's made to look wonderful, I'm massively grateful. Perhaps this is the last chance I'll get to say thank you to the production team and the crew for just cramming so much onto the screen. It was always meant to be a love letter to Europe and travel. Um, we had no anticipation of all of this stuff happening and of it seeming quite so nostalgic, but I'm very grateful for what we, what we got. I'm very grateful because you've given me a summer holiday on screen as well. It's kind of like, I feel like I've travelled around Europe from, from the way that it's been portrayed as well. Um, Saskia and Tom, I wanted to ask you as well about the, you know, these, these, these brilliant um, actors who play the kind of younger versions of Douglas and, and Connie and whether there was any kind of um, working together with them in terms of, you know, making sure that there were I guess, kind of reference points for both the performances in, in very subtle ways um, at all, if that was something that you worked on. Um, I, Gina and I had uh, a lovely couple of conversations and we met, I think we only met on, we only crossed paths on set, I think about twice. Mm. Um, but she had the task in a way of following my lead because we'd already started. So, um, she was left with the work, most of the work. Um, um, but also I think, I think the way you've written it, David, I think that there's not a big, it's not like we're having to work too hard to be the same person because they're the same in the story. They're just at different points in their life. So even if there are um, diversions a bit, it you sort of, it just all sort of falls into place. When I saw the whole thing together, I was really impressed with how, yeah, I believe that's her and, you know, um, older and younger, as it were. Yeah. I think Gina did, Gina had the hard and, and I think has done an, an extraordinary job of softening the, the edges. You know. Yeah. Tom, what about with you and Ian? Well, I, similarly, uh, I, I neglected Ian and um, didn't have anything to do with him. Uh, there, there was, uh, and he has rose magnificently to the challenge and survived it. Um, they both are, are brilliant, and and we did make a a, a conscious decision to not be. Um, too oppressed by the idea of finding impressionists for me and me and Saskia um, or that they should feel that they had to do that um, and that it was it's as if 25 years ago there was another couple called Douglas and Connie and they were living this life and how how it's isn't it strange to think that these these two quite different sets of people are actually the same people and that's what time does to you it's so it is about the operation of time on a on a relationship and on and on people and so actually their difference from us helps that and um the moments at which david chooses to flash back and to articulate moments in each time zone by going back and forth that's incredibly uh sensitively judged and very very clever and i don't can't imagine how you do that that's what that's what a, a writer's real talent i mean that's um a special thing so it's it, it works in a works in a strange way the things that we were worried that worry that they must look like us it, it was not a it was it was unnecessary yeah um david was it easy to kind of split it out episodically you know in terms of working out how how you know how that would work 
Um, it, it was, it changed a little. There was a lot of rewriting and the original premise again was that it would be a country per episode and that the whole of episode two would be Holland and the whole of episode three would be Italy and the whole of episode four would be Spain. And narratively it turned out that actually we needed to kind of take some of the hooks from the third episode and put them in the second episode and that um, other things needed to be expanded. We had to kind of collate Barcelona and Madrid and uh, Venice, we had to be very selective in what we chose. But um, it, it, there, was a, there was a lot of shuffling around. There was a lot of condensing, as always with an adaptation. You, there are things which you love and which are, would be luxurious to have and the schedule mm. doesn't allow. Or, or the, the, the experience of reading a book is so different from watching something that often uh, a series of, of quite similar scenes would bump into each other and you'd have to thin them out or space them out. So um, story beats that originally were meant to take place in Paris get shifted to a hotel room in in uh, Barcelona and that kind of thing. So there was a, there's a, both a kind of physical geography and the geography of time within the story and actually also the, 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 the pragmatic business of filming mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the story then, and the changes you have to make to, to make that work. I, I'm still sad we didn't quite get to um, Munich. There's some good stuff in Munich and... and, and, and what was going to uh, happen in Munich? It, well, the, well, the, 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 the breakup and the, the sort of there's a long simmering dark night on a on a sleeper train from Amsterdam to Munich, and then it all explodes in Munich. But it was uh, you know it actually when I watch it, I don't really miss any of it. To be honest, I I, I would um, you have to um, it's the business of adaptation. You know things change. Things Here is change. too. Yeah. Here is two, David. Here is two. Yeah. And, and Us again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we got yeah. some lovely questions coming in. Um, so I want to make sure I get uh, to some. And, and what's really lovely is that there's obviously um, people who've worked on the production in various parts of the world who are who are with us this evening, who are, are dropping in messages, which is lovely. Rosita Kanata says, bravo, a lovely hug from her and all the crew from the production crew in Paris. Um, one of our anonymous attendees. Oh, please put your name in. Uh, this is a question for David. You've adapted a couple of your own books now. Uh, how do you find this process of adaptation and what's in your process? Where do you start when you're adapting? Um, well, it's hugely hard. I have to say it's much easier to adapt someone else's book because you have a certain objectivity. When, you, when you've written a novel and lived with the novel, you, you have your own private version of it, your own, your own story, your own reason for why certain characters are there or incidents are there. And you have to be pretty ruthless and, and uh, focus on um, focus on narrative and dialogue, you know, because that's what a screenplay is. There are wonderful things in Douglas's monologue uh, that that you can try and put on the screen, but they won't sound natural as dialogue. You know, there's a bit in the Louvre where he gives his own potted history of art, and it's a really nice speech. And you can try typing it out and. and I know that Tom would have done it beautifully, but it sounds unnatural. It doesn't sound as if it comes from the situation. So that has to be your priority all the time. Does this work dramatically in a 3D world with a cast of characters rather than uh, the subjective, uh, emotional, uh, interior world of a novel? So you have to be ruthless. And you always have to tell yourself that the book is still there. You know, when you put it on screen, they don't take all the copies off the shelves. So there's another <laughs> parallel version of the story. And what I really loved uh, adapting this was being able to um, to really focus on dialogue. You know, everyone on the screen in front of me, they have wonderful two-hander scenes together that are longer perhaps than the scenes you'd usually find in a, in a TV drama. And I love watching the performances. That's the joy for me of adaptation, of the great difference between a a book and a, a screenplay is you get actors who can provide so much and fill in holes as well. You provide some of the stuff that you neglectfully as an author have missed and flesh out the characters. And I love watching those long two handers between everyone on, on, on the screen in front of me. Uh, they're a real joy. And so for every sacrifice you make, there's a, there's a, a proportional uh, pleasure to be had. Um, Yusuf says hello to all from Palma Pictures in Spain. So looking forward to seeing us, which was such a joy to shoot in Barcelona. Uh, Nana Drummond says, uh, when you're talking about the Louvre, Ali TV magazine in Finland, you shot scenes in the Louvre. Uh, were there any special arrangements or procedures for that location? I mean, you shot in some pretty impressive, you know, galleries and, and locations all over Europe. There were, there were special arrangements. Um, 
that were the Louvre was very they were all, I mean they've done it before they they're used to it um and it was a very complicated rigmarole that uh, I actually can't give you very much detail on but uh, <laughs> we didn't just because I didn't Hannah Hannah and Pat did all that work but it was um yes you can't just wander in there uh with a crew but they're very they were all very very generous to us the Miro gallery in Barcelona and the National Gallery and the Rice Museum we were given exclusive access for a few hours to these rooms and we sat with these amazing works of art in a way that you don't really get to uh normally um it was very still in there uh they they became like studios they became like sound stages uh with amazing art hanging on the walls which we then talked about in in amusing and funny ways scripted by david and uh it was very, and also that everyone calmed when we were in those places because there was so much rushing around, jumping from location to location. When we were in the galleries, there was the heart rates slowed down for some reason, um, uh, probably to do with the ceiling height and the space. Um, <laughs> art, but it was, but it was, it was very. Uh, those were very great moments. Um, but yes, we, the film and art gallery. Didn't, we, um, didn't we rework? A scene because the, the the Rembrandt of the Night Watchman was under restoration, so we had to do a bit of jiggling uh, because it was still being worked on. So I remember watching this little uh, machine just travelling very very slowly and meticulously across this beautiful painting. So we had to sort of work with that. Mm. It wasn't quite what we thought was going to happen. Very good. Magical rewrite, yeah. running rewrites. Yeah. Yes, we had all for lots of different paintings, kind of significant conversations to be had if we couldn't get to certain galleries. I mean, if nothing else as well, it's an incredible journey into art appreciation as, uh, as well. And I loved reading that, that Tom and, and Thaddeus, a lot of these places you'd never been to as well, you know, and so it was a wonderful opportunity to, to almost have your own kind of amazing tour guides around these wonderful places. I had the um, the glamorous experience that you were talking about earlier, what people think um, it's like just flying into these countries and having a little summer holiday. I kind of had that <laughs> the entire time. So I flew in and was like, oh, Paris is amazing. See you in the next city. You do all the hard work and I'll just pop in. Um, so it was an absolute pleasure. And David, thank you so much for giving us the best summer ever. Um, whilst also at work and it was a real joy to see those cities and those museums uh, in such a unique way. Um, I wasn't needed for the scene in the Reich Museum but I remember going along and just sitting with the crew and watching it all happen. It, it just felt very special. It was mm. so quiet and uh, there's no way I'd ever get to see those places like that unless we were, I was doing this job. So um, it's, it's a real, real pleasure. Um, Frank's got a question for, for you both, actually, for Tom and Thadia. What was the audition process like and what mindset did you put yourself in to eat, meet the demands of the casting director? Who wants to pick that one up first? Tom? I'll start, yeah. Um, the, the audition process is pretty much the kind of um, the normal system. Um, you get a, a script through and they say they'd like to see for an audition and you do uh, a few and then eventually I met Tom for a read through and I was really, I was actually quite nervous, but he was really nice, which was, which was great to have um, such a big TV personality to um, just be a really nice person. So that was really, really helpful. And then, yeah, things just progressed and I got the job. <laughs> and did you find it quite, you know, in terms of what, what you were told about Albie, were you, were you kind of encouraged to, to, I guess, kind of, you know, bring your own interpretation of him in a way? Yes, yeah, it's, it's always it's always a difficult one because sometimes you go in and and your interpretation can can can, can work really well or it can be um, oh, that's completely not what we want, but the, you have to be able to take direction and then listen to the directors and even the other actors for for um, when you're working together on these jobs, which is what we did really well. I thought all four of us and the rest of the cast when we were we did we spent a, a few um, like minutes before because we only had a couple of minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we did it we did it and um it was really fun doing working all together with the crew it's like a yeah. few big teamwork Thadia, what about for you for that process um so i sent off a self-tip 
um, of a couple of scenes and Kat, oh my goodness. So one of them, she was busking uh, and I sang a Bob Dylan song, he was my hero. So immediately I was like, yes, I love Kat. She has great taste in music. <laughs> and the other scene is a buffet scene where she's just eating everything whilst talking. So I hauled everything out of the kitchen and set that up. And that was my tape sent off. And then I went into the room, I think with, um, who was in the room? I can't remember. I'm not sure, but I remember, I think it was just Sarah Crow and maybe Hannah. I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, and then I met all these guys at the read through for the first time. And I was very nervous because Kat is so different to me uh, and she's so confident and loud. And it was, I felt a little bit scared of that challenge, but um, meeting these guys and having, having been able to talk to David um, and Hannah and I had a massive conversation on the phone just about um, who Kat was and where she was from. And that was so comforting and very, um, they made me feel very welcome. Great. There's a really, I like this question, but unfortunately it's another anonymous attendee. Uh, to everyone, have you ever had any Douglas type travel experiences on holiday, leaving your bag on a train and having to wear an, an I Heart Venice t-shirt, for example? Oh. <laughs> well, I suppose I should fess up to a couple, shouldn't I? The, uh, the, <laughs> yeah. the, um, there's something that happens <laughs> The jellyfish, that's real. Uh, there was an incident with a bike, which in real life is much, much worse than how it is in the novel and in the, uh, in the, um, in the screenplay. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not, everyone I think has those kind of travel moments where you want it to be like a travelogue, you know, you want it to be perfect, but the hotel is a little smelly or the, <laughs> the food is awful or something. And so, there's nothing specifically autobiographical in Douglas's domestic dilemma, but a lot of the little irritations and frustrations and embarrassments, I'm afraid, are, are horribly real, yeah. Um, Tom Hollander from an anonymous attendee. Uh, please, can you talk through the logistics of filming on a train? Uh, was the film, uh, was the time pressure tricky and what happened with costume changes? Saskia, you already mentioned about having to change in the small toilet cubicles. Yeah, well, we, we rented, we had carriages and the whole crew and cast were in a carriage. So we, we were, um, uh, we had our own carriage. Um, as we've already said, one, the sequence at the beginning of episode two, which I don't think people have seen, was going north. Um, so there we were sort of lying because we were actually going south. But um, in every other way, almost felt like we were in real time. We were sort of shooting sequentially in those bits. Um, the bit when we went to Paris on the Eurostar, that was a real journey. We were, the crew was traveling to France to, for the beginning of the European shoot. And in the script, uh, there's a moment where they go through the tunnel and Douglas says we're in we're in France now, as we came through the tunnel. And we, we sort of did that as we had one shot at that, um, sort of, actually, because there were lots of little tunnels. Um, <laughs> and uh, so every time we went through a little tunnel, I, whatever scene we were doing, I'd suddenly go, we're in Paris now, just in case it was better than uh, the last take. Um, all a complete waste of time that I think the one we used was probably the first one. But uh, there was a certain, pressure, anxiety, and productive, creative energy to, to those train journeys and to the containment. And there was a lot of climbing over chairs and squeezing around each other and passing food around and bumping into the camera and, uh, and then trying to get back into the scene. Um, and a lot of, uh, yeah, I mean, inconceivable in, uh, in the current pandemic situation. Mm. Amazing um, yeah. that we were allowed to do that spluttering over each other and um yeah shedding shedding virus in every direction way, way too much information um <laughs> did you think that whole kind of um you know almost kind of traveling circus sort of type thing added to the kind of energy of of the show in a way and the kind of I don't know, because you kind of get you really feel like when you're watching it that you are on the journey with them and you kind of it's, I don't know, it's just a, got a lovely energy to it. And I wonder whether that kind of reality of, you know, it being kind of, what we've got to be here, we've got to do this kind of thing, added to that kind of, 
I guess, that feeling? Well, it certainly meant, it meant, it meant that that feeling was very, <laughs> you didn't have to imagine it. Um, <laughs> But it is also in the story, uh, and, and it is as it is. A, there is a road trip, uh, but there's also a, there's a quest, um, mm -hmm. and there's there's a there's an inherent tension in the whole thing because you're in a family that doesn't want to be a family anymore. Really, uh, that there, there is a family of three in which two 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 members of it want to go, um, one to college and one to something else, and one person who is trying to hold it all together, and and that tension is is the is a is a comic driver but it's also the it's also the driver of the and then as things unravel and things become painful and it becomes worse that tension increases so so that the sort of scampering hamster around your losing luggage uh, never being on time all of that stuff it, it it was um it's that sort of show with this role for 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 you and, and Saskia for for Douglas and, and Connie do you mind just talking about what what the role offered you as an actor to do? Because it's such a fascinating story into, you know, a couple who have spent their, you know, most of their adult life together. Um, and, uh, you know, and then Saskia brings up this this whole point at the very start and they go on this journey. But as actors, they, these are these are these are characters that have a wonderful arc to kind of follow and a story to follow. Uh, and then within that, you have interspersed these kind of younger versions that also kind of are ways of getting to that point where they are now. But as an as an actors, what was it that these two roles allowed you to kind of explore as as actors for your craft? Really, is what I was trying to get to with that. Well, I, I um, yeah, I found Connie fascinating because on one level, I don't I don't think she handled it very well. I think she's being a bit selfish. <laughs> <laughs> so I would have said to her, Connie, you know what, you know, it's all very well landing this information in front of Douglas now, but you've got this holiday planned for three weeks or whatever. Um, but I think she's, you know, I think like she reminds me of lots of people I know. She reminds me of little bits of myself. So you sort of, you augment the things you recognize and you take from, from people that you know and recognize. And the script was so good that, uh, and the book too, I used the book as backstory for myself. That was always a real luxury to have the, the whole story in a book. So there's stuff about Connie's childhood, there's stuff about Connie's previous relationships. And I think as we get older, you know, Connie, Connie's a woman now looking ahead and she's got more life behind her than she has in front now. And um, she's, she has confidence. Douglas has given her confidence mm. being in this, with this very loyal, loving man. Because I think I found the younger Connie really important for me. So yeah. she's this wild, chaotic artist. And I don't think that part of her has ever gone. It's just, she's had to subsume it, she's had to manage it, she's put it aside, you know. There's various points through the story where she, she says to Douglas, I don't wanna, I don't wanna get stuck, I don't wanna get stale, I don't wanna get bored, I don't, you know, she has a fear of box sets, she's having naps in the afternoon, she's terrified of what's coming. <laughs> you know, she's, she's this artist and the, the, the desire to see these paintings and to take their son to see these amazing paintings sort of overarches any sort of well our relationship I have I have a big problem Douglas we have to talk about our relationship because I've been sitting on this misery for a long time yeah but I I, I just I found I found her positivity very uh interesting to play i she's a very positive person even when she's going through a really shit time and i found that very interesting to play mm. um and and the piece asks for real truth and humor you can't forget it's a comedy but you can't forget they're going through a very painful period of their lives and I loved that juxtaposition 
and I was delighted to be able to work with Tom Hollander, who I think you do that so brilliantly, Tom. And David has written this extraordinary balance. So, you know, Douglas can be running after Connie saying, okay, I've changed my mind, we're gonna go on holiday, but he's in his socks and he's worried about the glass in the road. So, you know, there's this beautiful flip flaps all the time, which I was really wonderful to play and also a bit scary sometimes thinking, well, I hope I'm not gonna make it too serious or I hope I'm not gonna make it too funny or I hope I'm not gonna make too light of this. Yeah. So I think there's one point where they're in, I think they're in Paris around, Paris where they hear Albie coming back late at night and we realize that Connie has actually been lying there in the dark for ages with her eyes open thinking and I love I love little moments like that because suddenly we're aware that she has another life she's just not it, it's there's other stuff going on that she's not talking about hmm. Tom what about for you with Douglas um I can't remember the question. <laughs> what what it, what the role offered you as an actor to kind of explore? Oh. What you you kind of I guess really enjoyed about playing Douglas? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, I I mean I, I am not a father, and I am also um, have not hitherto been a husband. Um, so for me, I was referencing the book, but I was also. I think I was also referencing my own relationship with my father, which is the only father-son relationship I know well, which was not strictly speaking appropriate because it was the other way around. But um, it's funny when you're, you're, and then a bit of it is you're, uh, you're making some stuff up for yourself and then other stuff you, you're, you're referencing in your own life or as Saskia says in, in Friends. Um, and I was, he's, Douglas is, is actually a good man. He's a better man than me in a lot of ways. Uh, um, I share a, uh, I share his anxiety um, um, as a sort of base level, uh, sort of constant in my life, though I have a very different way of dealing with my anxiety than Douglas. Douglas, Douglas deals with it by keeping everything very ordered and, and I do it all, almost in the opposite way. So mm -hmm. I had, by being, you know, apparently careless and, and try to be, I'm trying to be cool all the time, which is, uh, you know, is, is not is a, a fiction. Um, but uh, so I got, you get the adventure of pretending to be someone else. Uh, which is one of the fun things about acting, obviously. I mean, it's the main fun thing about <laughs> acting, apart from the travel and all the flowers and the champagne and the <laughs> congratulations. Um, <laughs> the, but yeah. Um, there's a lovely, um, uh, Kian says, can't wait to see all the episodes. It's a privilege to play a small part in the UK film and uh, Kian, who's a runner on the show. Oh, that's it's lovely to hear when people have such great experiences on, you know, the yeah. production as well, you know, and that's testament to to everybody kind of making that 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 atmosphere, the right atmosphere. Um, and then we, we probably got time for, for maybe one or two more. This is from Jennifer, who says, David, what were your inspirations in writing the story to start with? Did it come from a particular fondness for travel and observing art? Um, I, I think uh, it had partly come from, yeah, that experience of seeing Europe for the first time. I think it had come from a particular time in my own life where I'd just become a parent. Um, my, my kids were very small, but I'd written in one day, I'd written uh, characters in their 20s and 30s. And I thought, well, the, uh, the obvious logical step is to keep going. You know, so many stories end on the wedding day with the first kiss. So, you know, that's the traditional ending to a comedy. But what happens if you keep the camera rolling for the next 20 years. And that was sort of the idea, really, that it was a kind of uh, a, 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 a sort of emotional sequel to One Day. Um, I hadn't at that stage really written about family. I'd been a bit nervous of it, about writing about husbands and wives and parents and children, because inevitably your own preoccupations find their way onto the page. But I thought it was time to grow up a bit and write about that whole messy, difficult business. and. And so to write a family story was another inspiration. And to write also about science, you know, so I'd written a lot of, about uh, a lot of characters who were sort of tangentially involved in the arts, you know, uh, in, in acting, or show business, television, publishing, whatever. 
Emma in One Day was a novelist and Dexter was a TV presenter. And I thought science is so rarely represented with as much passion and excitement either in fiction or on screen. And that I wanted to write a book that was passionate about science rather than an art and culture actually seem rather alien and frightening and intimidating to Douglas, as I think they do to a lot of people. So I wanted it to be both a kind of celebration of culture, but also a, a discussion of this other side of the coin uh, and, and uh, someone who has the same kind of passion, imagination and creativity, but in an entirely different field, something that I don't know anything about. Um, so I wanted to write about science and art in an in a equally passionate way. I think it's interesting what you say there about the kind of you know writing a writing a story about relationships past that point as well in terms of the way that that marriage is written about and and dramatized and stuff i think this is one of the many brilliant things about us is the way that that's been the truthfulness and the way that that's been been written as well um and i i think that yeah it feels like quite unique in that sense yeah, thank you. I mean, I, 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 often marriage is sort of portrayed as a kind of plateau. You know, you get married and that's it until you die. You know, it just kind of goes on. It's a sort of constant. And it isn't like that. Anyone who's had a long relationship knows that it's a kind of mountain range and has highs and lows. And within a family, there's not equal love in all directions. There are shifting allegiances and that can be heartbreaking. So it's, it's quite frightening at this stage to be putting four hours of television out there that's about family, you know, that's a kind of microscopic detailed look at, at, at marriage and parenthood. And at the same time, we've spent the last seven months in each yeah. other's pockets. So maybe it's also the perfect time for us to kind of scrutinize that and try and find the narrative pull of, of, um, of family relationships. Uh, someone just asked that very question. What were your thoughts about the series being uh, shown now in these times of lockdown, which have caused pressure in many marriages and also in these times when we can't travel? It's like, it's, I mean, yeah, it's kind of perfect timing, really. Or um, not. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it doesn't lead to a kind of, you know, spate of family breakups. It's meant to be positive about it. You know, and there's a lot of love in this family, even though it's sort of, it, it's having problems. But um, I, I, you, you always want a certain amount of kind of awkward shifting on the sofa. You know, you want people to sort of see themselves and their own dilemmas and their own frustrations and preoccupations on the screen. But at the same time, it is a comedy and I hope there's a lot of love and joy and care in it as well, even, even though some of it does go to some quite um, dark and difficult places. Um, thank you so much for your time, everyone, this evening, both both you wonderful people and, and everybody with these great questions. Thank you so much. Don't forget nine o'clock on uh, Sunday, um, BBC One. And after it's aired, all the other episodes will be available up on the iPlayer. Um, David Saskia, Thadia, Tom and thank Tom, you. thank you so much for your time and massive Please. congratulations. Thank you, Edith. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just before we go, uh, just because of all the talk of family, there was, um, there was the production family and... Uh, somebody that's not been mentioned was the sort of head of that family. And that's Greg Brennan, who was the executive producer from Drama Republic, who over guided the whole thing. Those of us who were inexperienced producers or anxious writers or anxious actors, any of us, he was a very brilliant, mature and avuncular, clever figure who um, looked after us all. And if he's out there, um, thank you, Greg for shepherding us and uh yeah brilliant thank you so much for that yeah. take care everybody stay safe thank you, thank you so much thank you thank you bye thank bye. you everybody for watching take care bye bye, bye.